Hi everyone, I'm Matt Cremona. And I'm Matthew Morris. And welcome to the Matt and Matthew Show. Today we have a very special guest with us. We have Todd Klippinger, or Klippinger, however you prefer to pronounce that, depending on where in the world you are, <laughs> and depending on your background in linguistics. <laughs> so Todd, thank you so much for being here today. <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. And it, you know, that everybody needs to know we've already been having a blast, so. <laughs> yeah, we're off to a good start here. <laughs> So, Todd, one of the really cool things about, um, at least I'm interested in learning about today from you, is you're doing this for a living. Every day, in and out, you're getting in the shop, and you're just kicking some butt. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about your backstory and what you do as far as the type of projects you're producing and for whom? Sure. Um, actually, I started out in 97. This is actually, uh, I'm not going to cover, I'm going to try to cover this quickly, but in 97, basically, I started out as a, uh, a handyman and then started becoming more uh, of a serious contractor doing bigger projects. And what I found through, through the remodeling and being a contractor was that I, I liked working on the old houses. And basically, a lot of the old houses have uh, built-ins uh, and I was I was duplicating a lot of existing trim, historical trim, creating a lot of built-ins to look like original work, and um, uh, really that's where I kind of got more into instead of being a carpenter, actually getting into to woodworking, because I you know there's a there's there's definitely a definitive line between being a, like a framing carpenter and uh, being a, a a trim carpenter, and then also. Uh, being basically a mill shop and fabricating a lot of that wor uh, woodwork and then installing it. So I, I kind of had a nice broad spectrum of all that of all that work. And as I continued through the years, I actually uh, became very involved with uh, doing all the design work on my projects and selling my high-end projects. So that actually gave me a platform to sell the higher-end woodwork. And basically as my my, my ideas and my designs and my skill set matured, I just continued to reach higher and higher uh, clientele with with what I could do and with what I could offer. And, you know, along with that, your reputation basically is growing at the same time. Right. So it sounds like it was a very organic um, uh, journey for you. you. You just kept going from each step and each step kept getting larger and larger as far as the amount of work you were doing. So um, as you and then you were talking with us earlier a little bit about a transition period that you're kind of in this year or the end of last year or beginning of this year. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And you know, uh, a lot of times people are wondering about making the leap, uh, whether it's with woodworking or, um, uh, and, and trying to get, uh, more serious about making income from it. And, you know, even I myself ran into a situation where, I had been getting lung infections and it turns out that a lot of the, the lung infections, the source of it was the remodel projects that I was actually doing. So um, uh, basically I had to remove myself from that situation. And I, basically I had to turn down a bunch of, I had to stop and withdraw from some of the projects I had lined up. And I just had a couple of uh, shop projects lined up. Now keep in mind, because I was a remodeling contractor, I was able to sell all my ideas, and now I'm not doing that. So it's kind of an 80% contractor, 20%, you know, woodworking, uh, doing custom projects from the shop. And that 20% relied on the 80%. So um, what was kind of interesting, due to health reasons, I had to just abruptly stop remodeling. And, uh, and I had a couple shop projects on tap. And all of a sudden, in just the, even the last couple weeks, I mean... I put the word out, hey, I'm not remodeling anymore. I'm just doing shop work. And the shop work has just all of a sudden just, it's just started pouring in. So I guess the thing is, you know, we, we go out there, uh, you'd think it would be natural. I could automatically make my living straight from the shop. But the fact is, you know, like I said, that 20% that of shop work came from the 80% of contracting. And uh, basically I had to just abruptly stop with no solid plan on where's the next project going to come from. So what did I do? I just kind of put the word out. Hey guys, I'm not remodeling anymore for health reasons, but I can still do the new stuff and I can still do work from the shop and that's what I'm focusing on. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was a little bit of a delayed reaction and a month later, it all just starts pouring in. So uh, the best thing you can do is if you're going to want to start making the leap and take the chance, you just really got to do it. And I was forced to. Kind of like, 
you know, uh, you know, when you think about it with Matt, you know, he started going full time with the videos and you were kind of forced to do it. You had to do something, right? <laughs> yeah, well, might as well. It's uh, a lot more enjoyable than anything else I was doing anyway. So it was kind of a natural progression for me. You know, and actually I had considered because I've, I've been wanting to push towards producing more videos and I've even upgraded my equipment and my lighting and everything uh, and the computer. So I've dumped some money into upgrades. But, um, you know, going strictly the video route was something that I had even considered myself. But I also had, I had money sitting on the table with current projects, you know, and I got to take that first. Because <laughs> I have bills to pay too. Oh, absolutely. So um, now that you've made this transition, do you, you know, what percentage of your work do you feel is like, are you doing cabinetry work? Are you doing... Um, you know, you're trying to, are you building chairs? Are you building bookshelves? Or, you know, what kind of stuff is coming into your shop? That's one of the big mysteries of, you know, where does the work come from? And, and um, you know, <laughs> certainly I have a lot of contacts. Uh, I've actually have the benefit at this point. I've been doing contractor work since 97. So I've built a reputation in my community for uh, doing everything from remodel to built-ins and high-end furniture and uh, furnishing. So, uh, I do have that benefit of a reputation, years of reputation behind me. But what's kind of interesting, because I was part of the trades, I'm also aware of a lot of opportunities that probably most woodworkers aren't aware of. So I'm not actually locked into anything. Um, I do have cabinetry on tap. One of my big projects right now is I'm building a set of rustic cabinets out of reclaimed. Well, these aren't reclaimed beams. This one project. They're actually timbers and beams left over from a timber frame home. So I'm building rusty cabinets out of those, and you can see some of my pictures at my Instagram even, and kind of follow on that. Um, uh, I have uh, stuff I'm making for a coffee kiosk. One of the local coffee shops is putting together a series of coffee kiosks, and I'm making, I'm making certain elements for that in a welding shop. They're making up a lot of the metal parts, and then I'm, I'm adding in the, the wood parts. Um, you know, I did a, actually behind me, uh, there's a model of a bench. And a couple weeks ago, I, I was contacted by a coffee shop, one of the local cafes, and the lady said she wanted a couple benches made. So I designed and built a couple of benches. And the short model back here actually represents what ended up being two seven foot benches. And they're a lot beefier too. They're not, that's a plywood model. So, um, you know, the work, it's, it's, it's amazing how the work comes in because once word gets out of what you do people kind of keep it in the back of their mind and then they say oh I need this fix or I need this bill I need this custom bill it needs to match existing and so there's a lot of opportunities that come about um, that that you just would never even think of oh and then like uh, also back next to the bench I have some uh, seat some bar stool tops one of the local metal guys uh, I, I have good contacts with like you know four metal shops in town and they'll do the metal work and they'll contact me to do the wood portion. So, um, you know, it, it, it just kind of comes in from all over. And it's a, it's a nice diverse range of work. So before I lose it, you had made a comment that you just said uh, a little earlier. And, and was that um, you have a range of opportunities that or contacts or something that most other woodworkers uh, wouldn't have. Can you expand on that a little bit? What what? What type of contacts are you talking about? Um, a lot of it, uh, well, a lot of my contacts, uh, number one, are other contractors. And uh, they respect my work. They've seen my work. They know that I'm not, one of the things I really appreciate, to be honest, and most people aren't going to be in this position, but because I'm a contractor, my background is a, as a contractor, I understand how houses are put together. So if they say they want something built in, I know exactly how to deal with it. I know exactly how to deal and accommodate with things like heat and electric and plumbing in the walls or, and all these things that may start to affect um, a project. Um, typically, if you have a shop make, that's just a cabinet shop make a project, all they think about is making the box to fit the hole. And there, there's, you know, it's not that that isn't effective, but certainly, you know, it's in my favor that I know more than just how to put the box in the hole. So. Um, basically, as far as contacts, it's other contractors, it's past clients that just want stuff built in. It's um, the metal guys in town. They need woodwork to go with their metal because metal and wood really are very hot right now. 
for a lot of projects. Um, you know, barn doors, I, you know, I can still do trim work. I, I mill trim work packages uh, for some other guys and then can install them. I can stain them, finish them, all this stuff on a professional level. And then a lot of the stuff that actually just has come through in the last couple weeks was from architectural firms that adjusted what they were doing and they were looking for a small shop that was a little more focused on specialty items than the cabinet shops were. So, you know, one of the cool things is my shop, it's, it's, it's strength is its flexibility and that it's not dedicated to anything. It's weakness is that it's not dedicated to anything. So <laughs> I, I can't compete against, I can't compete against the cabinet shops. But the fact is I'm very flexible in what I can put out very quickly too. So, so, um, they, I fit, I'm kind of a niche contra, a niche specialty shop. And so, um, you know, what people need to look at are those things. What are your strengths and weaknesses? And then who you want to target with what product? It also really sounds like that all of your years from, I think you said 97 to now, that networking you did, you know, building those contacts, that has continued on and enabled you to make this next step. Right. Yeah. You know, that's very important. You, you, you know, one of the things that was really neat to see was uh, Matt doing the uh, what, the Habitat for Humanity yeah. uh, thing. You know, the networking is huge. And one great way to start getting your face out there and your name and getting recognition is, is uh, find something that you believe in and support it with a donation. Because a lot of the people that are going to these um, fundraisers for things like Habitat or what other charities you might have in town, you know, there are people that... Um, like nicer things a lot of times and it, it does depend on which function it is uh, some of them the people have deeper pockets than others you know <laughs> but but it's a great way for people to start getting uh, recognizing who you are um, I'm also very plugged into the artist community um, so people recognize me not only as a contractor but they've become to recognize me as an artist so uh, it changes their perception it opens a lot of doors of opportunity as opposed to being a cabinet maker, you know, just being a straight cabinet maker and not being able to do anything creative. So you got to be, you got to be a great connector. You got to be getting out there and meeting people. You can't stay holed up in your shop all the time. So Todd, tell us a little bit about the the work that you like to do, because that's the, the interesting thing about working for other people is you're building things that other people want. So if you were in your shop, what's something that you would want to make? Man, you you really kind of it, it's neat that you ask that because you know what a lot of woodworkers <laughs> believe it or not I kind of I have to laugh because they admire what I do and I'm like no 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 you know I'm beholden to you know I have to do what everybody else wants and the fact is I'm like you have a job you have cut and dried hours but you get to do what you want when you go to the shop. So I kind of admire the position that a lot of the woodworkers are in because they get to do what they want. You know, um, I'm, I do very well at rising to the challenge of dealing with the constraints that I have because basically I'm working on people's houses all the time that have a very specific style. So when I build something, it has to fit with the design and architecture of the house, obviously. Um, there in and of itself, that's one challenge. And I do very well at meeting that challenge, you know, cause basically for me, success in design often is the fact that when people go in, if it looks like it's seamless and always belonged with the house, that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted, especially because I work on a lot of older homes and I want it to look original to the house other than the fact that it's obviously brand new. But, um, you know, when it comes to to just wanting to do my own stuff. It's funny because I, I, I would work for a living and sometimes I get frustrated. I just want to, I clear the table and I just want to build something for fun, you know? And I usually have to build something small for my wife, you know, that I can get done fast. But the fact is, I, I would love to get more into sculptural work. I love, I love sculptural furniture. I love doing bent laminations. I have a vacuum press. I've built forms and done bent work. I really, I love, I love that. I love Art Deco. I love Charles Rennie Macintosh. Um, certainly a lot of my designs even are influenced by uh, Frank Gehry and, and my ideas anyways. I haven't got to put out a lot of the things that I want to do. But if you look at my portfolio, when I was actually allowed to cut loose and 
it was within the constraints and it was proper for the house, like the modern design closet, that was something that um, the people wanted something, they're, they're big fans of art and the, they like go to the museums around the world, they travel the world, go into all kinds of museums and, and basically it was a dyed piece. It, of course, it was a box, it was a big closet and it had big red doors on it and it's got this design and I did bent metal work with it. You know, I was able to cut loose, even though it was a box, I was able to cut loose with the design and the color and they, they loved red, they loved black and we put curves in it and it, was, it just exploded. So it was really neat. A lot of my designs lean and my ideas lean towards an Asian influence. Um, and you can see that actually in some of my projects. But I still, I still have to restrain myself and only put it where it works. I can't, I can't just apply these great ideas where it's inappropriate or I can't sell them. You know? So once in a while I'm given enough leeway, uh, freedom to, to introduce a little bit more idea, you know, artistic idea. And, and you know, a lot of people are very um, conservative. So they don't want to do something that they got, they can't live with. And I don't blame them. You know, you got to be a little bit adventurous and let me loose on the design. <laughs> so. Did I actually answer the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. you did. I think so. But yeah. I'm going to throw you no. another one here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, fur to further this discussion. <laughs> so Todd, I've been looking at this this thing behind you, behind you on your right there. I'm not really sure what that is. Well, actually, I'm lying. I know what it is because you told me what it is, but I'm sure everyone at home isn't quite sure what that is. Why don't you tell us about what that is, how you designed it, how you built it, and where it was shown? Okay. Well, this actually is the second version. The originals, uh, it, this is a chandelier, number one. It is a Frank Lloyd Wright slash Japanese inspired chandelier. Of course, at a certain point, Frank Lloyd, Wright, Frank Lloyd Wright's work was inspired by Japanese architecture after he went and visited Japan. And um, uh, so what you'll see in it actually are a lot of elements that are, uh, you'll see in a lot of architecture that's very currently popular, um, like the inverted hip roof. And the, there's a shoji grid in it, Japanese design grid in it. And um, uh, it, it, it just has a very much that Frank Lloyd Wright prairie style, modern prairie feel. But um, actually the original concept when we were talking about, I built this originally for some clients back in Ohio because my brother and I had built a big Frank Lloyd Wright inspired house. And I got to look, do a lot of the design work for the custom work on the interior. And um, uh, they wanted chandeliers and this was the design I came up with and originally it had the tree of life pattern like in the in the grid and then I was uh, I was in Ohio when I was up around Cleveland Ohio I went to a shopping mall and there was a stairwell tower and that stairwell tower had the exact form that this has except the window pattern was different and I basically took a shoji screen pattern format and placed in that and um, and you can see that in, in pictures of the of the thing, but I built two of them out of ribbon mahogany and those hang in the house that I built from like an 18 foot ceiling. And um, then I was invited to show at the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. They had a fine woodworking exhibition at the museum and I was one of the first people that was invited to show. And the curator, when he called me, said, you're invited, I've seen your work. He said, I've looked at it. He said, you're in. All you got to do is say yes, and you got to build the chandelier. That's what I want. So I built the chandelier, and it, uh, it ended up showing in a fine woodworking exhibition in a museum. So I was very excited about that. And actually, I didn't even, I thought it was a joke because I didn't even put in. Usually, you put in for shows, and you get juried in. And this guy calls me out of the blue and says, you're in. And I'm like... Who is this? Really? <laughs> who, who pulled, who's, you know, <laughs> so I thought it was a joke, but totally legit. So, yeah. So chandelier showed at the Museum of the Rockies. You know, what was really cool about that too. You know, there was, there was like two dozen of us that showed and six of the people, six of the people I knew of and had admired for years, had admired their work. And even though they didn't know me personally, well, two of them I've got to become friends with over time. So also when they asked if I had any recommendations, I recommended these other guys. They all got in, of course, on their own merit anyways. 
Um, but I got to stand shoulder to shoulder with all these people that I admired over the years. And it was neat to be able to say thanks for the influence that they had on me, even though I've never worked with them, but they were just kind to me whenever I talked to them about woodworking and they inspired me. And then I got to show with them in a museum. And, that, and it was really neat because you hit that point where you're standing there and it's like, I have arrived. I mean, you know, it's big stuff. <laughs> all these people that I was like, ah, you know, over the years. And then I'm, I'm standing there. My, my stuff's in the museum exhibition with theirs. And, uh, you know, it was neat to see that they also, even though they maybe had seen some of my work, I'd send them an email picture or something. But to see the work in person is always, you know, different. And it was neat that they felt like, too, they never wasted their time with me. That's awesome. I'm, not a lot of people have like had that experience or probably will, to be honest. So that's, that's really cool. Well, you know, the thing is, too, to get there, you just got to keep pushing it. And you got to keep challenging yourself. I mean, neither one of you guys, when you look at, I think what really captivated me, I don't, I can't, I just don't have time to follow a lot of people. But, you know, Matt, your work captivated me because, I, I mean, when I cruise once in a while, I get time to check a bunch of people out. I mean, you're building. This once in a while. Yeah, you're, you know, the secretary you're building, I was like, wow, this guy's <laughs> ambitious, you know. And I started following yours, and then I love green and green, and I just haven't had time to make any. And I saw your stuff, Matthew, and. I was really impressed with it. So then, Thank you. then you guys hooked up, and I was like, "Hey, there's a marriage made in heaven. They're doing a video together." <laughs> so you guys are legit, and I, I think that's cool. You know, you guys do nice oh, you, work. You heard it here. So You're legit. Yeah. Well, keep we, keep we, watching. We, <laughs> well, we appreciate those comments and too, Todd. Thank you very much. And I, you know, I, I so. <laughs> But, but the point is, you know, you guys, you guys didn't get where you're at without pushing, taking risk and pushing yourself. It, it's, it's a lot of hard work and that's really the, the secret to it all. Speaking about hard work, um, so maybe it's, I think it's a lot of question, a uh, question a lot of people have, which is, so you're doing this for a living. How do you charge? Are you charging by the hour? Are you charging what you think a piece is worth? Are you just saying everything's a million dollars and hope someone's gonna write the check? Yeah, you know, that's probably one of the biggest challenges is, is, uh, is how to charge for your work. And really what it comes down to is, it was always easy for me to figure out how to charge on um, projects as a contractor. And then what I realized, you know what? It doesn't matter if I'm building whirly gigs for somebody's yard or if I'm building a chandelier for the museum. The simple fact is I have an hourly rate that I have to charge based on real business costs. So once I got over, should I charge as an artist? You know, the fact is I, I, still, I still will bill out and bid a project like the Chandelier as a contractor or as a professional shop. So basically, instead of people, you know, because I've been beat up a number of times over the years and I do miss bids. I, I miss the bid on rusty cabinets I'm building right now, for example. But, you know, I, I just push on with other projects and keep it going. But the fact is, it was a little bit easier for me to, to charge as a professional because I say I'm a professional shop. Instead of, trying to, instead of trying to promote myself necessarily as an artist where it's sort of this gray ether and nobody can pin down what you should charge, basically I'm like, hey, I'm a pro shop, basically, and I don't wanna make any secret of it if it helps anybody. I know what my costs are for power, for gas, for uh, my insurance, which is very expensive um, as a business, and um, my taxes. And basically, if I wanna work five days a week, you know, I, well, I figure it on 10 hours a day, five days a week, and I have to charge 40 bucks an hour, you know, and because that's the minimum that I work anyways. Uh, so, uh, but I know what my actual business costs are, so my actual hourly rate then gets applied to how long I think it will take to do a project. Now, if you don't want to get into figuring out what you're uh, trying to break it down by the hour, the simple fact is over the years too, I've gotten away from that because I realized basically your day goes in half, half, uh, half day chunks. Basically, if anything I do is never a couple hours, it's a half day. They occupy a half of my day. Then it's a full day. So, you know, you can figure things. How many days is it going to take me to do this? It's going to take five days. Then, you know, based on 10 hours a day, you know, 
times 40 hours and there you go, plus materials with a little bit of a markup to cover yourself too. So that's kind of the, you know, what over time what it's ended up boiling down to anyways. So, so it's easier, it seems like, to, to, to convince people you're a pro shop or, you know, your, your bid numbers are based on real tangible things like taxes and overhead as opposed to just I'm an artist. Just kind of take that out of the equation because there's less for them to dicker with. And you say, well, we can take something out of the project. You know, you don't want oak, we can do it in poplar. Well, no, no, I want oak. Well, okay. Yeah, you got to take a firm stand. Right, right, right. And you know, it's, it's tough to do that because when you first start out, you don't have any confidence. And I'll tell you what, clients can tell that too. They'll, they'll eat you alive. I'm definitely at a point in my career and along in years, basically, here's my price. If they want to take a look at it, is everything negotiable? Sure. But at the same time, you know, anymore, it's like, here's, you know, we'll, we'll look at the price and then they might ask me about it. I'll justify it. And they'll say, well, you know, we really only had this in mind. And then I'm just like, well, I'm sorry, guys, you know, I can't. I've, I've, I've cut it down as much as it can. If I could charge that much, I would have. But, you know, I have to charge this much for it based on the time involved, my design time, pickup, fabrication, and install. This is where we're at. And, and it just has to be a yes or no. And you can't, you can't, you got to have confidence in what you're charging. And you also have to understand you got to survive. So, it's, it's, it can't be an emotional thing. It has to be more of a, a, a tangible, I'm paying taxes and, and overhead and it's taking this much of my life and I have to charge for it. So it's based on real things that they can't negotiate. Let's talk about your habitat thing real quick. Um, how did you get involved with that? Me getting involved with that is like one of those stories that just shows you like the connections you make out in the world just day to day. Um, so how I got involved with that is um, my wife, when we, my wife and I were getting married, or right after we got married, the jeweler that we bought the, her, uh, her, her wedding bands from, we went there for, I don't know, we went there for something, we like checked the rings or to clean them or something like that. And one of the people that worked there, she also volunteered at Habitat and she was part of the planning committee for this fundraiser, which is what eventually I donated to. So that year, that was three years ago. And that year I donated one of my spice boxes. Um, I'll put some pictures up here if so, someone hasn't seen this before, but that was a big, that's a big project. That was an 80 hour project. And I, I donated that thing and that thing went for sale and it sold there at the auction that year. Um, so my wife was part of that planning committee and that's how I kind of got involved with that because through that connection, she talked to that person at the jeweler, she became part of the planning committee as well. And then I was there kind of tagging along with that, making that donation. And I also donated that year a big uh, wine rack. So they, could, they were doing like a, a fundraiser based on that wine so you could get a tag and you can get a wine off the, the rack. So I made these, oh, I forget how big they were. I think they were like, they, they held like a hundred and something bottles of wine. They were pretty big wine racks. So I made those as well, donated those as well as the spice box this, that year. Uh, last year, my wife didn't do the planning committee, um, so I didn't really donated anything but then this year I donated again I did two cutting boards and four bowls and the the um, the goal this year with the, with the fundraising was they wanted to create a bunch of like baskets so like group auction items so that's why I went that route instead of doing something standalone but uh, yeah you know I go and I set up there for that fundraiser go in the morning we'll do all the setup because uh, there's a lot of people there we're all setting up you know putting the chair covers on the uh, the chairs and setting the tables and putting all the auction items out and all that stuff. So it's a lot of fun. And the people that you meet there doing the volunteer work as well, that's more connections to further yourself in the future as well. Just as Todd was saying, oh, well, just meet people, get out there and meet people, network. It's all, this world is all about networking more than anything. <laughs> so is your stuff going in the live auction or in silent auctions? Silent. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't have them that big for the live auction. That's like the multi thousand dollar getaway packages. <laughs> Now, have you done any donations yet, Matthew? Um, not for like um, projects here from the shop. I do donate a bunch of time, but that's a little bit differently. So one of our local high schools, they have uh, Westlake High. Um, I've been, uh, I'm a mentor. So I mentor two or three high school students every year for them. And I've been doing that since 2002. So for a while, 
And um, so I don't know if you guys know, or, well, you guys know, but for the audience, uh, I do have a company, I have employees, and uh, we do software and web development work, and so multimedia technology stuff. So on, on that aspect, every year we have two or three students, they come in, multiple visits, and they can talk to you know, me whenever they want, and it's, and it's to see if they're interested in that type of stuff. So um, as far as donations, I donate time that way in the community, and I, as I said, I've been doing that for a, a, a good amount of time, since 02. Well, you know, even if you aren't actually donating a piece, people still talk about, you know, Matthew and what he does and he donates his time and man, you ought to see his furniture. He does this great work. And, and what people don't, you know, even if you aren't directly donating a piece or being involved with creating a piece for uh, something that you support, word still gets out about what you do. And so you're getting out beyond your own Beyond, you know, you may, wherever you work, you know, people around you will know what you do and they'll at some point ask, you'll get uh, uh, requests for projects or to build or fix something. But especially getting out in the community, people like to support people that they like. And basically, if you're supporting your community through donations to Habitat or volunteering with them or volunteering your time like you are with uh, the school, all of that is great ways to make um, connections. And so, you know, it, you got to get plugged into your community. Um, I think uh, going back to actually donating pieces, though, um, some of the things that I recommend, and I, I've done this and actually demonstrated, uh, a woodworker came out, Brian Havens. Um, he does some great turnings, and he's in San Jose, and he writes software. Um, actually, he writes machine code, but he, um, he came out and helped me do... Um, uh, a shaker bench for charity. I was behind on schedule and I put out on Twitter. I was on Twitter at that time, but, um, uh, I put out, where are all the guys that want to help me for free just for the experience? You know, now I'm behind on this project and he, he answered the call, came out. So, so we blew out this, I, you know, the shaker bench for charity and we barely made it there in time. But, um, you know, I got up and I tell guys, you got to get up for the bigger stuff. Push, push that it gets put in the live auction. In the live auction, it always brings more money. But what I do is I do a full donation. I don't take any money back because a lot of times artists will take money. They'll, you know, if it sells for two thousand, they get five hundred or a thousand. They take fifty percent or twenty-five percent. And I don't do that. I donate. Number one, I pick a cause that I believe in. Number two, I do a full donation. But typically, what I'll do is I'll, 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 I'll get, um, I'll get um, dinner. For my wife and I for free so you know if, if tickets are 30 or 50 bucks we get in for free and my my project has to go in the live auction and I have to stand up I tell them when it comes up you, you have to let me talk so I get up in front of all these people that I don't know and I have to say I yeah I, I say you know I believe in this cause and I could I it would be easier for me to write a check but I believe in the power of what you know that I was given these gifts and this talent and that I'm using it to support my community and I will support my community before I support. There are a lot of great things you can support around the world, but I'm going to support my community first and I want to give my best, offer my best to the community. And basically they see that you're genuinely, you know, supporting, you believe in what you're doing and then it plug it, it pastes your face on that project too. And you can't just go one year. You got to go a year, a second year, and a third year, and you'll see you start gaining a reputation, and they start looking for you, and the value of your products start going up, and and then you know, uh, once in a while you'll be somewhere and people say, oh, you, you know, in the store you're at Target or the grocery store. Oh, you donated that piece to the thing, or you know, I got good newspaper coverage on when the guy came out from California, and you know, we were I would I'd be walking around and people. I saw you in the paper. You did that thing for the charity and it, it brought in more than anything else. I mean, you know, because of all the exposure we got and it, it brought in a lot of money and it did really well. So, you know, the thing is donate to what you believe in, push it as much as you can, get your face attached to it as much as possible. Um, for smaller stuff going in the, in the silent auction, not always possible, but also sometimes you can get up and, and kind of make an announcement. Hey guys, you know, my name's Todd Clevenger. Make sure you hit the silent auction and check out my basket. We got a lot of great things. Check out, you know, my, I got some bulls over there. Be sure to bid on them. 
basically just, just here I am, that's what I do, and I'm here supporting the place and donating my time, you know, with, you know, moving stuff at the auction or cleaning up or whatever, and people will start recognizing that. So you got to promote yourself a little bit, you know, take advantage of that opportunity. And it's stuff I really do. I don't, you know, I'm not just preaching it. So Todd, we're really interested in hearing your, your opinions and your, your viewpoints about the, the shop in general. I mean, for most woodworkers and people out there that are just kind of doing this as a hobby, the shop is kind of a getaway place. So it doesn't really matter how long things take or how you know, fidgety some tools are, things like that. So what, what's your, your, your ideas, your opinions on the shop? Because like, you're making money at it, so if the shop is not efficient, it's not going to be in your best interest. So what is your general thesis, I guess, on on shop like is it is it worth more to you to buy the nicer tools that aren't going to require any setup that can get the job done faster or is it better to save some money here and there and kind of you know save money in the long run what are your thoughts on that well uh certainly my thoughts are skewed towards uh as a professional i have a little bit different um parameters in which i have to make my decision and and you know, I understand what a budget is. I still have a budget. It's not a free for all. Get to buy whatever I want, um, because basically, whatever I spend tool money on tools, basically that can't go into retirement. Um, of course, I get to deduct that, but the fact is, I don't get to. That's money I don't get to put in retirement to set aside for a rainy day to take vacation on or anything else. So uh, it's not. It's definitely not a, a, a free for all for me to get to buy tools. Um, I'm very judicious about the tools that I buy. I make sure that I'm going to use them. And when I first started out, I did buy cheaper tools. I actually started out with, with a lot of craftsman tools and they did not last. I think most of them were dead by a year and a half as a professional. And I, I'm actually take really good care of my tools. Um, it was largely the way I was, uh, you know, when I was in the military, you take care of your equipment because your life depends on it ultimately someday and basically I'm very good at maintaining my equipment and I use it I use it but I use it properly and I do good maintenance so I care very well for my tools it probably doesn't get any better than than with the way I treat my stuff but I found out good tools are well worth the money and man it pinches up front I'm not kidding you to buy some better tools but I have never regretted a, a nice tool purchase and you know I I've been building you know a little fest tool collection and of course, those seem to be sort of the high bar mark, but uh, uh, they don't, they're not the only ones that make good tools. I've got quite a mix of DeWalt, Porter Cable, uh, Makita, um, Bosch, Festool, Jet, Hitachi. And you know what? No single tool company makes the best of everything. I typically buy based on what specific features that a tool has. And so um, I'm willing to take the extra pinch up front and buy a better tool. I also like buying new tools because I like having the warranty because typically if it's gonna break down, it will break down in the warranty period. And, um, and I'm willing to buy name brand tools because basically every tool company and every tool manufacturer is gonna have its percentage of defective tools. What I'm doing is with name brand tools, typically that percentage is a little bit lower than if let's say you're buying at Harbor Freight. And so, I'm just sort of hedging the bet that I want this the statistics stacked in my favor that the tool's going to be reliable year after year, day after day, and you know the tools that I buy are worth repairing actually as opposed to replacing. So um, that's kind of where I go with my decision on tools, and and I've had to build up my tools too. I mean I started out with a small. I've gone through three joiners. I just wish I bought the big one to begin with. But you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't afford it, you know, I couldn't afford it at the time either. So, um, and you know, at a certain point I've, I've had to upgrade my table saw a few times. I wish I could have bought the big one to begin with, but once again, I couldn't afford it either. So, um, I have the same struggles that, that most hobby woodworkers do. I still have a budget, but I also have to think I got to make my living from this. So I actually take the extra pinch and spend the extra money up front and he, as much as I can now that, that I've kind of got the momentum going. And you find that pays dividends in the future for you? Yes, yes, my, my tools have done well at earning their keep 
as a professional, certainly. You know, and, and the thing is, good tools aren't just about, you know, people think, well, it's like, I bought a Festool K-Pax after all these years. Well, I had this opinion, you know, I've got a Festool track saw and I've got the Domino and I've got the planer. And I'm like, those are really sweet tools. They're really exceptional tools for what they are. But I'm like, come on, you know, I've got a Hitachi slider that I just love. I don't know that these were actually designed for human ears <laughs> <laughs> because they don't stay in <laughs> Apple. <laughs> so anyways, I have a Hitachi slider. I've been using it for 10 years and man, it is a dream. It's so accurate. And, um, you know, I was like, well, the k packs and, and I get furniture grid cuts out of it day after day, year after year. And, um, uh, um, the k -Pex, I couldn't, I was like, man, it's, you know, it's $1,400. It, it's just overpriced luxury saw. I used one on a job. When, actually, when I was out in California, I started using a, a Brian, Brian Haven's saw. And, and I couldn't believe how accurate it was and how, when I was doing the trim job, how fast I could flip between all the bevels and how accurate it was and the dust collection. With me being a remodeling contractor, dust collection's huge. And once I started using it, it sold itself. So I guess the point out of that is, as an example for the Capex, it's really not just an overpriced luxury saw. It actually has features that make me money as a professional. Now, are those features worth it for the hobbyist? Probably not. You know, it, there were things that I very specifically need for what I do. However, um, good tools typically higher price tools have features that will enhance your performance and your production and that's where the payoff is in the reliability. Did you anything else you want to talk about today, Todd? Anything that you're interested in or what questions you want questions you wanted yeah. for us or No, I guess uh, I really I really actually enjoy seeing you guys uh, participate in the woodworking community. I think you inject a lot of great personality and um, inspiration. So, you know, it's there's sort of this at times this conversation woodworking's dying fact is it's not and it's it's due to people like you being active in the community i i personally have i hope to get more active again I, I there was a time i was more active but you know um my business consumes so much of my time and uh i hope to get more stuff out in the future but um you know guys keep at it and also to everybody else that's watching the best way to propel yourself forward in the craft is to go out keep doing it and just keep challenging yourself you guys you guys are great examples of that and um mm. of of challenging yourself and advancing in your skills in the craft so that's the real secret to woodworking is to get out in the shop and just do it thank you todd um speaking about yeah thanks yeah sp speaking about um online woodworking community where can everybody find you? What's, what's the best place to find your content, your articles, your videos? Well, uh, number one, you can go to my, my website is AmericanCraftsmanWorkshop.com. And from there, the only thing I'm on anymore as far as social really very effectively is Instagram. And you know, if you, my Instagram, there's a little feed on my homepage at, uh, um, at my website. And if you look at my Instagram, it is a great snapshot of the things that go on in my life as a pro woodworker. <laughs> and not only will you see some of my projects, but I think what's important is to understand what goes on inside the head and the way I see things. And so you'll see architectural photos. You might even see some, uh, you're gonna see a little, I try to keep family stuff to a minimum, but I think one of the important messages there too is you need to keep balance. So, you know, um, inspiration and projects and, you know, um, and all that will be kind of seen at, at the Instagram feed. And then if you go uh, on on YouTube, it's Todd Clippinger. Um, I think it's just Todd Clippinger. <laughs> well, we'll have links. So, but That's you can well. find yeah. me through my, if you go to my website, <laughs> you'll find my videos. <laughs> so, and I keep those, I keep those are strictly woodworking. So Todd, thank you so much for spending the last, oh, at least hour with us. <laughs> it's been a blast. I really enjoyed talking to you. Hopefully we can have you back again at some point. Um, if anyone has any questions for Todd, please leave those down below. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions you might have for him as well. If you'd like to learn more about me, you can head over to my website. That's at macaroni.com. And Matthew, why don't you tell us how we can find you? Yeah, and you guys can find me at mmwoodstudio.com. And as always, 
We really appreciate your feedback and your comments. And above all, we love you to subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends. And until next time, we will see you in two weeks. Subscribe. These yeah. guys are legit. They're legit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> see you. <ya. laughs> Bye. Bye.